One of the things that separates the Bible from all other books is its flawless accuracy in predicting future events. In fact, one-fourth of the Bible was prophetic in nature at the time it was written. Of the 1,000 prophecies woven throughout the fabric of both the Old and New Testament scriptures, 500 of those prophecies have been fulfilled. Now, these were not generic predictions that could be interpreted to fit any scenario. These were detailed prophecies outlining events, places, and in some cases, given names. And while the odds of these predictions coming to pass were nearly infinitesimal, still they came to pass to the minutest degree, whereby eliminating any ambiguity as to the origin or source of these prophecies. As Christians, you and I can take great comfort in knowing that if God fulfilled 50% of all Bible prophecy, will he not also fulfill the remaining 50%? Included in the 500 remaining prophecies are promises concerning the future return of Jesus Christ. In Acts 1 and 11, we are told of how the disciples watched in amazement as the risen, glorified Christ ascended slowly into heaven. Suddenly, there appeared before them angels adorned in white robes, and they said unto the disciples, Men of Galilee, why are you standing here staring into heaven? Jesus has been taken from you into heaven, but some day he will return from heaven in the same way you saw him go. The New Living Translation the last time this world saw Jesus Christ, it saw him hanging lifeless upon a Roman cross, his flesh hanging from his bone like ribbons of clothing, his face covered with the saliva of an angry crowd, his beard pulled from his face, and his tender brow adorned with a crown of thorns. The world watched as Jesus Christ convulsed beneath the torment of crucifixion and heard his feeble voice cry out for something to drink as he slowly dehydrated upon that implement of torture. But God is not going to permit that to be the last image this world has of his only begotten son. In fact, the testimony of Scripture is that Jesus Christ will one day return again. But this time, the world will not see him in his apparent weakness, but in his omnipotent strength. He will not come again to suffer. The next time he comes, he will come to render judgment. The world will no longer see him as the lamb sacrificed from the foundation of the world. When Jesus Christ returns, he will return as king of kings and lord of lords. And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. And he that sat upon it was called faithful and true. And in righteousness he does judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire. And on his head were many crowns, and he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. Revelation 19 and 11. Knowing that Jesus Christ will one day return again, should motivate each of us who claim allegiance to Jesus Christ to live every day of our lives in anticipation of this blessed hope. Not in the sense that we become so heavenly bound that we are no earthly good, but rather we must realize that you and I have a hope beyond this world. For we know that when this earthly tent we live in is taken down, that is, when we die and leave this earthly body, 
we will have a house in heaven, an eternal body made for us by God himself and not by human hands. And so we must set our affection on things above and not on the things of this world. In fact, everything connected with our spiritual life and destiny is tied into heaven. Our Heavenly Father is in heaven, as is our Savior and Comforter. The myriads of our fellow believers who have successfully run their earthly races are in heaven. Hebrews 12, 23. Our names are recorded in heaven. Our citizenship is in heaven. Philippians 3 and 20. Our inheritance is there, 1 Peter 1 and 4. Our reward is in heaven, Matthew 5 and 12. And even our treasure is in heaven, Matthew 19, 21. There are numerous reasons why Christ must return a second time. We'll discuss only three. The first reason why Christ must return is because the promises of God the Father necessitates Christ's return. In such passages as Genesis 49 and 10, Psalms 2, 6 through 9, Jeremiah 23, 5 through 8, Zechariah 14, 4 through 9, and Malachi 4, 1 through 4, God made certain promises concerning the coming of his son which were not fulfilled in his first advent. For an example, in Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6, we read these wonderful, wonderful words. For a child will be born to us, a son will be given to us, and the government will rest upon his shoulders, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. There will be no end to the increase of his government or of peace on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and righteousness from then on and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will accomplish this. These prophecies did not take place at Christ's first coming. Therefore, he must come a second time to fulfill them. Because God is not a man that he should lie, nor the son of man that he should repent, if God has spoken it, will he not also fulfill it? The second reason why Christ must return is because the promises of Christ himself necessitates his future return. In that beautiful passage located in the opening verses of John 14, we read this precious promise from our Lord. Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. And so Christ must come a second time because he said he would come a second time. If Christ does not come again, then he lied. And we know that just like God the Father, God the Son cannot lie. In fact, Christ is a very personification of truth. If Christ said he will do it, he will do it. The third reason why Christ must come again is because the promises of God the Holy Spirit necessitates Christ's return. The Word of God describes the Holy Spirit as the Spirit of truth. It is He who teaches and inspires the authors of the New Testament and brings all things to their remembrance that Jesus had said to them. 
Thus, every New Testament promise concerning the return of Jesus Christ comes to us from the Holy Spirit. If Jesus Christ does not return again, then the Holy Spirit lied. And the scriptures that were inspired by the Holy Spirit are unreliable. Hence, Christ must return a second time. And so there are three reasons why Christ must return. Number one, because the promises of God necessitates a second coming. Number two, the promises of Christ himself necessitates a second coming. And number three, the promises of God, the Holy Spirit, necessitates a second coming. Hence, the veracity of the entire triune Godhead rests upon the visible return of Jesus Christ.